then it should be fine. Yes. I don't know. You... What I got to do this week. What? Okay, wait. Do you have a place where the train is going to go? You can start the train. It's completely off the rails. You start today. Oh, I'm so excited. So this, the patient I saw on Monday is somebody that I saw in 2000. Okay. In 2000, she was a fairly straightforward 40 and 10 patient. It's, I'm going to pause you right there. When you say 2000, I'm like, so that was like two or three years ago. No, that was 22 years ago. Yeah, 22 years ago. Yes, 2000, not 2020, 2000,000. Yeah. 22 years ago, she was a 40 and 10 fibromyalgia. She stayed for a week. She was out of pain, blah, blah, blah. Then six years ago, she fell or something happened. So she basically shattered her ankle and she was walking around on bone for six years. And then two years ago, they did an ankle replacement and that's a good face. What did they replace? What joint? The talus, the okay. talocabular joint and the talocalcaneo joint. Okay. And the surgeon said, it's really a good thing that you waited because the hardware used to be, he didn't say, use probably the word suck, but the hardware didn't used to be the best and now it's really improved. So they did the surgery and she ended up with CRPS, damage in the nerves, superficial and deep peroneal nerves given the sensory distribution in her foot. Pause for the lay people listening, CRPS is complex regional pain syndrome. Which doesn't, which used to be called reflex dystrophy and neither one of them means anything. Yeah. Complex regional pain syndrome is the name you get for RSD when you lock, I think it was six neurologists in a room for a weekend and say you have to create a new name because it doesn't have anything to do with reflexes. It is pathetic and not very many people get dystrophic. And they said, so we need a new name. And so now when there's nerve pain, they don't understand, they call it CRPS. So anyway, so she has damage to these peripheral nerves and that was the reason she was coming to see me. And then she said, the bottom of my feet, both my feet always burn. And I said, would you mind filling out the pain diagram? Because she circled just her ankle. And I said, here, fill out the pain diagram. And she circled the back of her neck in between her shoulder blades, both shoulders, both elbows, both hands, both hips, her low back, and both knees. And I said, oh, okay. So it was one of those wonderful events where you, she's a 40 and 10 for the lay people, that's a fibromyalgia patient. So she's back to where she was 22 years ago, 40 and 10, 40 and 89, because when you have complex regional pain syndrome, basically a peripheral nerve is damaged and disconnects from the peripheral tissue. So it's like phantom limb pain when you still have the limb. Yeah. Okay. So we did 40 and 89 to quiet down the phantom limb pain that for the foot that was still there. And then from the knee to the foot did quiet the nerve inflammation and then increased secretions in the nerve. And she left, she came in with her pain at a six or a seven, left with the pain at a one or a two, yay. Then the second day she came in, oh, and it only lasted two to four hours. So the next day she came in and I said, our goal today is to improve the motion in your ankle. And this is the fun part. So we did 40 and 10. The nerve in her foot was pins and needles. So from knee to foot, 40 and 396, a second unit for increased secretions in the nerve, and then started taking apart the scar tissue in the nerve in her calf and her foot. That was really sensitive. 
And then I figured it was scar tissue at the joint because in order to replace the joint, they have to take everything apart. They're breaking it first, yeah. Yeah, and they, like you're hanging there with soft tissue and then they put in this titanium thing. I did scarring and everything and didn't get it. It's torn and broken. Can you get out of my brain? Because that is literally on the list about when to use 13 and when to use 124. I use one, I use, started with 13. And the thing to keep in your mind is the frequencies never don't work. Yeah. So when scarring the blood vessels, scarring in the burst, scarring in the periosteum, when that didn't work, okay. If you take apart the ankle, what's going to happen to the connective tissue and most of the tendons in the ankle in the foot around yeah i did 124 and 191 and the pain dropped started dropping in seconds yeah so torn and broken in the round tendons the connective tissue and when, so originally she couldn't get her ankle to 90 degrees, couldn't get it straight up. So at the end of about 20 minutes, her foot was straight up. And then she said, it hurts right there. And right there was where the prosthesis bumped into the periosteum that were on the tarsals. Right. So I did inflammation and torn and broken in the periosteum. And she said, oh, that doesn't hurt at all. So then we switched, or I might have hooked up another machine and did increased secretions in the cerebellum, did 40 and 89. Don't be afraid to move it. It'll be fine. Yeah. Wipe down the midbrain. Yeah. What did you say about the amygdala? Put a muzzle on it. Put a muzzle on it. Put it in yeah. timeout. Yeah. Timeout. And then increased secretions in the cerebellum. And I had her first point her toes and then push my fingers yeah. point and then resistance in both flexion and dorsiflexion and plantar flexion wiggle her toes scarring in the nerve was a big deal scarring in the arteries if you look at the anatomy right torn and broken in the connective tissue torn and broken and inflammation in the lining of the bone inflammation in the bone itself and metallic toxin in the bone and this woman that's been living at a six or a seven pain for a really long time got up and walked around the treatment room barefooted with her pain at a one and it's i just love going to work how do you not love going to work um, there's a question I think that popped up, but I want to just circle back before we answer it about, about this concept, because I'm at this really juicy spot of my career teaching that I'm, I understand why the core changed so much because I look at the sports course right now, because our next one is in February and I'm getting ready, changing things. And I'm like, <laughs> I can't possibly teach it like this anymore. So the biggest shift that we've seen with the way you're teaching it, the way I'm trying to teach it, the way we're trying to work together as FSM practitioners is not only thinking what's on A, what's on B, but why did this condition happen in the first place? It's almost kind of like where functional medicine is so different than your conventional stuff is, okay, you're anemic. Why are you anemic? We're asking why. So when we have scarring and it's when you're a manual therapist, you can feel it. If you're not a manual therapist, you're testing for it. You'll see it in the restriction. Something is tight. You start thinking about 13 or 91 or 51. We've got all these options. And then when that doesn't work, you have to just take your hands off and sit for a minute because you know, it's scarred. You can feel it scarred. But why did it get scarred? The, things don't think scarring happens, and this is what my new slides are all about. Scarring happens for two reasons. 
one, something stretched or torn broke, and then it scarred as it healed, or something scarred because it was immovable. It was stuck. Like we see in frozen shoulder, you stop moving it and then it tightens up. It's adhered, not so much scarred. And exactly. It's also important to remember that torn and broken leads to bleeding. Bleeding leads to scarring. Yes. So one of the patients I saw yesterday couldn't, his complaint was trochanteric bursitis. The orthopedic surgeon offered to do the injection and he said, no, I'm going to Portland. I'll check with you when I get back. And it's trochanteric bursitis does not come from space. And he laid down on the table and his left leg left foot flopped out at about 45 degrees and his right foot was at about 10 degrees. And he said- like externally rotated? Externally rotated, yeah. Okay. Externally rotated. Okay. So this one is like this, that one's like that. And I went, that means that something is holding your leg in internal rotation. So I reached up towards his pectineus and brevis and put my pointy little fingers in there. And he went, ow, okay. There we go. So we did scarring in the nerves, scarring in the artery, and chased that around, and then got around to the backside of the ischial tuberosity, and that was torn and broken. Where and and it the bursa was scarred, but the tendons were torn and broken because as soon as we got the scarring out of the nerve and the artery on the internal rotators, all of a sudden, both feet are flopped out at 45 degrees. Then treating the trochanteric bursa and the tendinopathy in the gamelles of all things. Like it wasn't just the glute that was inhibited. Did I lose you? That's gonna work. And- Oh, yeah, just- Was it me that glitched? <laughs> Yep, no, froze. No, you were frozen on my computer, Carol, for the last. Time. I was frozen too. It was yeah. you this time. Okay. <laughs> Yay. So you might need to repeat that last thing you said. What okay. was the thing I said? Oh, anyway. Go back. Trochanteric. Yeah. So the trochanteric bursa was because the internal rotators were stuck. Right. And so the external rotators, including the gamelles, ex the glute was inhibited because it was anterior and it was protecting the femoral nerve. Yep. But the external rotators were also inhibited and stuck. And there's this bursa. Right. And then the poor little gamelles, well, the piriformis can't do it. We'll volunteer. We can do it, coach, really. No, dude, you're that long. It, it, thank you very much for your service, but. Okay, how do I unpack all that? Especially when it comes to the hip. Like the hip is such an easy joint, but it has so many compensator applications. Like the range of motion is very simple. It's the reason why most colleges start with the hip because flexion, extension, internal, external rotation. So when... When we as practitioners are looking at the hips, so you're just talking about, we're always assessing, right? So uh, like the minute your patient walks in the door, that's when you're doing your gait assessment. You're not telling them to walk up and down the hallway where they're all guarded and freaked out and they know that you're watching them. So when they're lying on the table and after you treat them, and like you said, you're looking at external rotation on the table and the left foot flops out and the right foot stays straight, you're automatically should be thinking it's not about a weakness. There's a tightness in the antagonist preventing that foot from flopping out. So you're thinking right away, I'm going to the internal rotators. You go to your most common criminals, right? The pectineus, brevis, they're always like working against you. They're little conspiracy terrorists. The little poor little femoral plexus comes all the way down through there and they're protecting it. Right. So when you're thinking about structures, to your point, it's not just connective tissue and muscle belly. You've got this huge plexus of nerves, vessels, 
arteries, like you name it on all of that can get adhered together. And of course the muscles are just going to continuously splint to protect those vessels and nerves and all the other thing. And the other ones are inhibited. And the other ones are inhibited. They're not weak. If one more person walks into my clinic to tell me they have weak glutes, I am going to scream and I'm going to put it on YouTube because especially athletes, they don't have weak glutes. They have inhibited certain slips of certain muscles, but they're never really weak. We're both frozen. We're both frozen. But the audio works. Okay. So the pod, the people who are listening to us on audio get it. It's just, we're going to be glitchy on YouTube. So hopefully that, that part made sense because a muscle doesn't in its entirety become weak. You're frozen again. So I, hopefully I'm still, Kim still has video. Okay, great. I'm just going to keep talking then. So when we talk about this cascade of what we do when something is tight and something is torn and broken and where do I start? I typically do still start with 13, right? If something is adhered, something is scarred, I'll go to 91. Are we back? (laughs) I just kept talking. Here we go. So talking about, did you catch that part about when something is scarred? I typically still start with the scarring until I'm proven otherwise, because sometimes it is just scarred. And if that's not working, then you have to think, how did it get scarred? Did it tear? Did it overstretch? Did it repeatedly overstretch over time, like we see with athletes who have continuous micro trauma going on that leads to macro trauma. And then in comes 40 and 89. When something hasn't moved for so long, I will always do a drive by on 40 and 89. I don't have to wait for somebody to get up off the table and try to move. I'm just going to put it on there. But to your point, when you're talking about the guy and his hips just fell into external rotation, he wasn't afraid to go into external rotation. So maybe you're not spending that much time with that individual with 40 and 89 because he was like, ah. But here was the thing. I did run 40 and 89 without talking to him because it was more painful than it should have been. Aha. When I palpated up in the pectineus and the brevis area, and you know where the femoral nerve artery vein complex comes down? Yes. There was no tightness. There was no tone. There was no spat, nothing. It was, ow, that hurts. Okay. So release that scar tissue. And then using 30% of my normal grip, pressed and he went oh yeah there's something it's like his brain was looking for it yes and he has a fairly stressful life situation and he doesn't have a lot to think about except the restriction in his hip so I had one machine running on 40 and 89 I'm I admire the people that want to use just one machine for a longer period of time but I got. Did we lose her again? I don't know what else I can shut down because Carol just froze again. So I'm going to try to, I don't know if it's me. I don't know if it's her. I don't know if it's the zoom universe, no audio either. Okay. Thank you for the people that are chiming in on the chat. Okay. Kim's still going. So I'll, <laughs> I'll just keep on talking until Carol joins us again. Okay. When you freeze, I'm just going to keep jumping in and I'll just finish your sentences for you. Okay. So. 40 and 89, and then 81 and 84. So this whole concept of he wasn't afraid to move it. He was experiencing more pain than objectively there should have been. That right. means it's, I did have 40 and 10 running. Right. And then added another unit with just 40 and 89 to quiet down the central stuff. Right. Because that diagram we have, I think it's even in the core now. If you have pain in your knee, the nociceptors in the knee go up the cord and sensitize the cord, go up to the thalamus and the cerebellum to the thalamus to the sensory cortex all work together. Right. And even though you have pain in your knee or your hip, 
the, the thalamus, the midbrain, tells the cerebellum, this is painful, protect it. And it tells the sensory cortex, yeah, don't move that stuff. When yeah. he says move his hip, you listen to me and I'll tell the cerebellum and we'll just get him from the living room to the kitchen and you just don't worry about what fires went. And that whole complex that you just talked about was the reason why I did the, the sports course, the second day of the sports course, because you can't possibly, I don't care if you're an athlete or not, you can't possibly move effectively and efficiently after treatment without it. Exactly. And in the old days before FSM, you were getting these results that what we're getting in a day or two days took months. I can honestly say that as someone who was there in the trenches with it. So maybe there was that slower adaptation because the nervous system and all that whole cascade that you talked about up the chain had a longer period of time to be making these adjustments because you were only incrementally increasing range of motion. When the brain had time to get used to it. and that, That's it. what I mean. So it wasn't afraid to do it. It had these like little baby steps. So, you know, it's like slowly walking into the ocean when you have that grade of where you're, and as opposed to just like dropping off. And that's what we do. And I get it. It can be really scary to increase that much range of motion and take pain down that fast. It yeah. wouldn't be plausible to think that the nervous system would have an opinion about that or be okay with that for that matter. So I think it's a great idea for the, I'm going to keep talking because Carol's frozen on my side. I think it's a great idea if you have, even if you have at least two machines to have some sort of, especially when you're, especially when you're breaking apart so much scar tissue to have something like 40 and 89 running, like I'll always say, I'm going to run something on the background or it used to be concussion protocol or it used to be something. But if I know I'm going to tear, I don't want to say tear apart, or I'm going to increase someone's range of motion. I'm going to see adhesions. I know there's going to be a big shift. I will absolutely run 40 and 89 on a separate machine because it just is going to make that last 20 minutes of when I'm doing like the active stuff, just that much easier. And for me, I always run 40 and 10. Right. Because any peripheral pain has spinal cord sensitization and Jay Shaw is coming. Oh, I wait before lane change. Mary Ellen Chalmers. Yes. Is doing 60 to 90 minutes at the advanced on yeah. FSM in dentistry, but FSM in head, neck, and face pain. Oh. Now that she has her master's of science in head, neck, and face pain from UCLA or USC. I'm so glad that you brought that up because at the beginning of this talk before, I don't know if everybody joined, but I was freezing. Normally I'm in California and it's still 85 degrees and I'm always running around in t-shirts and tank tops. And this is the first time I've had this full zip up because I was at the dentist and I had, a, I've been having wonderful experiences at the dentist the past 10 years, but I still have some sort of PTSD as a child walking into a dental office and I freeze. So I want to tell a story about the first time I met Mary Ellen. I believe it was at, it was when she got her award, her Ruth Johnson award or her leap award. I can't remember, but she was given an award, Ruth Johnson. And I was so excited. I'm at the advanced. I think it was my second or third one. And you're going through the track of um, all the different speakers. And I believe she was like in the ballroom doing like a general talk for everybody. And I was going to ditch and go get a snack or go to my room. Cause I thought, why would I care about something with dentistry? It changed the way I practiced with everything, not even just head and neck, but she was talking about, I think it was failed root canals and just this constant inflammation that's happening. And the way she explained such a complex component of health in these easy to break down terms, when the body is so busy fighting this low grade infection or dealing with the inflammation, it has no stores to deal with anything that's musculoskeletal based. So 
immune system activation, constant. Constant. And I was really lucky because when I was practicing in Canada, our really good friend is a dentist. He had a 3D comb beam imaging. So I was on the plane. I'm like, Scott, you have to get this. And he's like, Kim, I have one. You've had them. I'm like, okay, just checking, just making sure. Cause it's really important. He's, I thought you were at like a physical medicine conference. I'm like, I am. He's like, why do you know about this stuff? So long story endless, anybody who's listening right now, if you were going to come to the advanced, be very excited because Mary Ellen is not only an amazing speaker and a brilliant dentist, but the way that she will merge the two worlds it your life will be forever changed so I don't understand how long the advance is going to be it sounds like with all the speakers that you have we're going to be there about three and a half weeks something like that yeah (laughs) but the nice thing is we have the advance for two days yes Thursday Friday and the symposium is Saturday Sunday and that's how we get everybody in so the afternoon oh I emailed Jen Sosnowski yes. and asked her if she would be our functional medicine speaker. All and right. I, yes. The, the feedback that I don't know if you've been getting them, but I've been getting emailed directly because I interviewed her obviously when you were gone, that people have been listening to it three and four times because Jen is, she's such an intense, passionate, fast speaker. And there is really so much packed into that episode. So there's been great feedback. So I, I can't wait to ha- have more of Jen because- I'm hoping she says yes. That'll She be- has to. Yeah. So that she'll be there on Friday. And I'm, if we do 60 minute slots, the dive into the material is not as deep, but we get a bigger variety of speakers. Right. So- if we do 90 minute slots, we only have two speakers in an afternoon. If we do six. 60 minute slots are also better for adult learners. I have to say, I'm not sure if she's frozen for everybody, put it in the chat if she is, cause I'm going to keep talking otherwise. So we can just keep the train on the track. There you are. So you are. I was just listening to, I've been, I take these little webinars on Mondays when I can on physical medicine and 60 minute slots are actually much better for adult learners because we apparently don't have 90 minute attention spans anymore. We have 20 minute attention span. We are decreasing the way we focus on things. Okay, good. Anyways, that's- I think that's, Great. And then to, before I forget the sports course and the sports advance are also going to be during that time. The calendar is on frequency specific.com website. However, I'm taking all the signups myself to take the sports advance. You have had to take the sports course. So know that. And then we already have, I think four or five people signed up. So I am going to cap the classes really small 20, 24. Otherwise it's a zoo because we just do too much. So register early. (laughs) We're going to Chicago next on the 22nd and 23rd. We have 30 people. Of course you do. Of course we do. We're back. Yeah. I I think, oh, and then also to note on to what I was just going to talk about, there is no FSM sports live stream. I'm, I've cut that out. Too much got lost in translation with my course anyways, not being there in person to touch and feel and jump off of tables and take your neighbor's foot and put it up there. I don't think I'll be offering the live stream option in some very specific cases I might be, but I think it just has to be, it's an in-person. That was my gut all along to do it as an in-person only. And yeah. And do they need to take like the pain and injury or the five day before they take the sports or they can do sports by itself. You can be an FSM newbie and just take the sports course because I put together a prerequisite slide package that they can learn at home before they come to the sports that we worked together on years ago. So it has all the theory and some of the videos of the lecture component of how FSM works and the history stuff that you don't need me to be talking about so that when you come to the sports, you've got a little bit of background anyways. You've got that prerequisite slide package. It's going to be so much fun. So much fun. I want to talk about, okay, do we answer the questions or do we just, let's answer the questions first. Debbie had asked, I think when you were talking about your patient that you saw, why didn't she come to you after surgery for help? Only asking because I've had clients who have gone away from me, zero out of 10 in pain. 
and life, something happens. She doesn't come back and she goes somewhere else first. Oh no, she lives in California. Oh, there you go. Only so much, I think. That was okay. That's, yeah. And then Dana, yes. My first experience of success with frequencies is the Sonicare toothbrush. Yeah, no cavities since then. I also have a Sonicare that I love dearly and I am think I don't have cavities because of that and some other things. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cynthia wrote, is not in pain anymore. So that is, oh, hang on. Let's go back. Dana. The calls address the discomfort. So remember when a patient is ticklish? So hang on, you have to, can you finish reading the question? Because not oh. everybody can read it and people are listening to you. Would one of the pain protocols address the discomfort associated with detangling a child's hair? Is the polarized positive still neck to feet for something like this? The protocol for making somebody not ticklish. So I had somebody where I just, I had to treat his hip and you touch his skin and he just broke into giggles. So I hooked him up neck to feet and ran 40 on A and the sensory and motor cortex on B and left it on while I hooked up the stuff for his hip. And then I put my hands on him and it didn't tickle. And he said, it feels as if it should tickle, but it doesn't. How did you do that? So to quiet down hypersensitivity, 40 and 92 might work. And then the other, the other thing is they have the detangling spray. We use it on horses' tails and it just makes it slippery. And then you just go slow and you let the kid watch the favorite cartoon and you, hi Ellie. <laughs> and yeah, that's a baby. Yeah, um, baby. And then just go slow and use the detangling spray. Okay. That, but 40 and 92 might work. And with a kid, the wet towels might not be their favorite or the wet wraps might not be their favorite. So you might even try just the magnetic converter stuck in the back of their shirt and in the front. And he's asking, is that stuff called hoof and mane? Well, I don't know about hoof and mane. But there's so many spray and conditioners. Spray yeah, cool. I've I have three teenage daughters. Trust me, when they were little, you need it. <laughs> and yeah. sometimes just a wider tooth comb, especially when the hair is wet, and then it's easier than using a skinny tooth comb. That's, that's just, a mom thing. That's just a mom thing. Yeah, that's not a that's not a science thing at all. Yeah. All right, Cynthia's question. Saw a client with multiple old neck traumas from barefoot skiing water wow, skiing, that's, that's bad winter skiing broken clavicle is there any way to break a clavicle without also doing the neck walking the dog one day about five years ago dog was not pulling ha ha something just gave he was 10 and 10 nerve pain went to the er opiates don't touch nerve pain he got a shot of cortisone in the rhomboids okay pain went down Hyperesthesia, had physical therapy, hyperesthesia, four, five, and six, dermatomes, atrophy, and the upper trap to about, ooh. Ran the neck protocol, he's not in pain anymore, so that's not an indicator. A Cynthia, do a Babinski, atrophied upper trapezius, bad, atrophy, muscle, bad. Babinski, upper and lower reflexes, yeah. That's well, an MRI would be a really good idea. Yeah. Uh, that's it, usually the physical exam, muscle strength and reflexes will tell you what the MRI is going to look like. But the MRI actually tells you whether or not it's safe to treat conservatively. Binsky tells you whether or not it's safe. It showed nothing. Okay. No, just no. <laughs> That, no. With hyperesthesia, C4 to 6 with atrophy in the upper trap? And the MRI. So there's two kinds of radiologists. There's one kind of radiologist that says normal degenerative changes. That is meaningless, like no meaning, zero meaning. So you put up the sagittal section and what is a... No, 
mild degenerative changes at C3-4, a one millimeter bulge at 4-5, two millimeter bulge touching the fecal sac at 5-6, a three millimeter bulge touching the fecal sac and making a slight indent at C6-7. Yeah, there, that's a report. So she wrote, right, his report. So is he just saying the MRI showed nothing or you actually saw the MRI report and it was all normal? Because that's, I never take patients' words for anything. So I'm like, just show me. I don't even take the radiologist report. If a radiologist writes a report, there's one radiologist where I always ask for an addendum by somebody that actually reads them in detail. And these days they send them on CDs and then I have to read them here at the office and find the sagittal sections. And then you can see the other- said, he, he said the doc said it showed nothing. I'd like to see what he thinks nothing is though, because nothing to somebody is a whole lot to other people. Yeah. And the, the part of the challenge with medical physicians is somehow they have the idea that in order to inflame a nerve, a disc has to touch it. And they seem to have missed about four, five articles in spine that show that the discs do chemical demyelinization of nerves and inflammation of nerves. They don't have to be any place near it. There's that. So there's that. All right. Any other questions before I get going on my little story of the oh, day? On your story. No, there. Okay. There is a, Minette had a quick question, but I want to just talk about the stuff that I wanted to talk about really quickly. And then we'll go back to Minette and the other questions that pop up. So why I wanted to talk about the whole 13 versus 124. So scarring versus torn and broken was a patient that I had, who was in a motor vehicle accident that I knew had scarring in the dura. Like I knew that was one of the limiting factors that I needed to work on because everything else was falling into place. The mechanism, she was rear-ended. You just know there was that flexion and extension. Scarring in the dirt wasn't doing anything. And I was following it to a T, <laughs> getting her to move. It was still <laughs> painful. Everything was still, it was becoming more tight as she was moving. Towels off, let's go back on the table. The dura didn't get tight from not moving it. It was a flexion extension injury. It was torn first. Ah, makes perfect sense. Mate, and this is why, like, I was like, it is never, it never not works. I know that it is scarred. So what, why did it get scarred? Her back still, she still continued to flex and extend. She's still a human. We're not walking around like Lego characters. So there was still mobility. It was scarred first. It was torn first. And then the scarring that it happened was just mending what was torn and broken. So I went back even further to it bled, it tore. So it was 18. And again, I have all these regrets of frequencies that I didn't use. And I just did this big motivating post on Instagram today about regret nothing and leave it all up there. And, but there's only so many frequencies in an hour that you can try. And I'm a scientist. I'm going to go with statistically what should work the fastest, most effectively the first time. But if something tore, if your brain is already going to that mechanism of injury where there is flexion extension trauma, if it tore, you better believe that it bled. So I really do think that 18 and 124 have to work together. And the more I'm respecting that process, the better results I'm getting, the faster results. I'm not saying you don't have to, I still had to use 13. It wasn't just done with torn and broken, but I think it was Dave Burke that was talking about thinking about you have to remove the blocks. Like you have to remove, think of Pac-Man, right? Like you have to figure out what those little traumas were. Yes, 13 needed to run, but you needed to run the other stuff first for it to really work. And this is, this, this is just so exciting to me because that's the learning process for an FSM practitioner. Right. It's learning to believe your fingers and believe that the frequencies are doing exactly what they're alleged to do 
So if they don't work, it's because that's not what it is. And if that's not what it is, then what is it? So I had an Ehlers-Danlos patient and 124 and 77 held for months, but she said it made her back pain work. And her back pain was at T12, L1, L2. Okay. Factoid, random factoid, Ehlers-Danlos patients are also famous for having tethered cord. Ah. And the cord is tethered, the phylum is tethered at T12, L1, L2, right? Yeah. So she said, I stopped running 124 and 77 for Ehlers-Danlos because it made my back hurt. And she went like this. And I went, so treated her shoulder, got that out of the way. And then let's see what we can do about your back pain. Mm -hmm. So sat her up on the table and did two machines. First time I'd done this, note to self, one machine on scarring in the cord, one machine on scarring in the door and had her do rotation first and then side bending. Yeah. And then flexion. And she flexed at the hips since no flex here because right. the place it was stuck was in between her shoulder blades. And all of a sudden her thoracic spine muscles would contract. She said, I can stack, mm. it actually move. But the clue was, and the thing I missed the first week she was with me a couple of months ago, was she was an Ehlers Danlos. It was just 124 and 77 and done and dusted and aren't we nifty? I missed the tethered cord, but the tethered cord didn't really show up until two months later. But right. I had to listen to when I run Ehlers Danlos, torn and broken in the connective tissue, makes my back hurt. Well, make your back hurt. It's got to be the dura. Where does your back hurt? T12 L1. Oh, and up at the base of my skull. Uh-huh. So before I, before we go more onto that, you did something really important with your spine movement. And I'll tell everybody who's listening too, this is another kind of new part that I've emphasized with the sports course. When we do that flexion extension to increase spine mobility, flexion and extension can be a very scary movement. So a lot of the times when I am trying to increase spine mobility. Remember the spine just doesn't flex and extends to your point, it side bends and it rotates. So when we're working with cord and dura, getting the pliability, the elasticity, the motion. And again, we don't just have spinal flexion and extension or muscles that just flex and extend. We have muscles that side bend us and rotate us. So to start your range of motion, I will always start with side bending and rotation before I have them flex. It's almost like a little dynamic warm up because it, you're safer in these ranges than you are to flex and extend. That's going to light up a facet and it's going to light up a disc faster than if you start with rotation and side bending. So if you have a patient that you know their back is going to light up, start with those mobilities first before flexion and extension. And as far as I know, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, as far as I know, the dura has vertical fibers and rotational fibers. They do, absolutely. Yeah. And there are little ligaments holding the nerves. Exactly. Exit the dura and the foramen. Yeah. So you have to yeah. loosening the rotary yeah. fibers first. Correct. I, your eyes went all crazy and I know you were reading the chat. So let's go to the questions. So let's go to the easy one first. Rick asks, what time does Phoenix FSM symposium end on Sunday? What time should I book my flight back home? No, stay, stay for it all. Rick, Rick, have you ever known us to end on time at six o'clock? Ever? No. Uh -uh. And then fly on Monday. Yeah. So fly out on Monday, stay and enjoy the pool and the, and all and the, the conversation. That's the good part. And, or fix it. So we never finish at six o'clock. 
because we have a panel at the end of the day yeah. with the best speakers on the planet. That's right. At nine o'clock. I don't know where you live or if you can get out of Phoenix at nine o'clock at night to go where you want to go. Manette, any experience with healing a stoma from a tracheostomy? Client stoma is still open and waiting for surgery to close. Surgery is a really good idea. <laughs> it's just that I don't have any mileage with that. And I open wounds. It wouldn't hurt you to run wound healing. Why would they take out the trach and not close it on the same freaking day? Excuse me? I, never mind. Derek's question is the one that made your face go funny, I bet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Derek writes, he only ran the emotional and emotional protocol. I'm not sure which one it is. Patient got a headache and threw up. What happened? If it was the concussion protocol, tell me what, if it was the concussion, concussion protocol is the only one that I know of that makes and it's 94 and 94. 94 and 94 gives people a headache and it's not, it's pretty rare, but it has happened where they throw up. And emotion, was it just emotional relax and balance or was it a single emotion or is it one you made up out of? TTH. Oh, TTH. Oh. This is all on you. I'm glad you're here right now. <laughs> wow. Okay. So TTH, it, oh, yes. Thanks, Derek. Tendency to have bad things happen is the first part of it, at least the way I've rearranged it in the custom care mode bank, is the seven frequencies that Ryan Wilson and one of my patients came up with for the energetic tendencies to have bad stuff attracted to you. And then the last half of that protocol is 970s of various sorts. And I've never had it make anybody throw up. So I don't know. Did it look like pea soup? I don't know. I have no idea, Derek. It's, yeah, that's a first. So. Interesting. Yeah, no, got nothing. Mostly because there's, you have to, it would, you'd have to know lots of grief. Oh. But TTH isn't for grief. It's, no, I don't know. <laughs> That's, yeah, there's more of a backstory. I there love when you say you don't know. When we get to Hawaii, there is a point in every seminar where I say, out loud to everyone. You guys know that we just make this stuff up, right? <laughs> but at the point when you say that, people are like, no, you know everything. And I don't believe what you're saying. And you're just being humble. There's, there is that. There's, when you see what the number one, when you see what the patients have dealt with, with yeah. courage, yeah. and when you see and feel what the frequencies do. Yeah. How could anyone possibly be anything except humble in the face of those two powerful forces? You're right. I don't get it. How could anybody in our position be arrogant or full of themselves? Like, oh, but there are. I know. <laughs> I have the same question for them. Where do you get off? I know. It's, but that's a philosophical discussion. That is. There's a couple more things we have to talk about too today besides, besides oh, that. Quick. We have lots of time. We have four minutes. Oh. So the gentleman that I keep talking about who came up with meth, who we don't do rice, we're using meth. So meth, again, is not methamphetamines. It stands for movement, elevation, traction, and heat. I had a few more emails over the last little while about more information about him. I did interview him. That podcast is now up. His name is John Paul Captain Zaro. He is an exercise physiologist from Canada. He has two websites. If you just Google meth and his name, a lot of these studies will come up, but I did want to bring everybody's attention to the two studies that are up right now. One is in the journal of applied physiology. The other one is in the journal of strength and conditioning. So we're getting more and more 
really good data, large studies that are being done with not just, not just meth, which is the combination of movement, elevation, traction, and heat, but just using heat therapy, especially heat therapy in with different types of co-modalities are not coming out and saying microcurrent, but I believe we are in a really good time to start putting together this data because there's a huge shift and people are very resistant to change. And I do understand that ICE has been the tried and true application for a very long time. I believe it was 1973, Dr. Gabe Merkin was the doctor that came up with using ice and he put together rice, rest, ice, compression, elevation. We're not immobilizing. If you just look at immobilizing in the last 15, 20 years, we are not casting, splinting, bracing nearly as much as what we used to. And why is that? Because there's been really good data to show that our bodies need to move to heal. And you all as FSM practitioners and the people that are listening to this podcast and watching us on YouTube are hopefully the group because you're looking at different modalities to try and not just getting a brace and not just getting surgery and not just doing all these things because hopefully the end goal is to have you move again. There's data to show that movement is healing. It's bringing blood flow to the area. So all the frequencies that we use, again, especially with torn and broken, 49, increasing the vitality, increasing the secretions. Like this all supports what this latest research and data is showing us that we need to move. So when I, yes, you have the inquisitive look on your face. It makes me think about a sixth machine that could just be running vitality in the blood supply. Ooh. And when you look at the lining of the blood vessels, the lining of the blood vessels secrete a substance that heals the blood vessels. So 81 and 49 increase secretions and vitality in the arteries. I'm gonna try it. One machine. Right. While you're doing- While you're doing the other stuff. Especially on acute injuries. Correct. See, look at that. We're changing science just right before your eyes. Just look at that. Just me and you and everybody listening. Everybody mark this day down, October 12th. This is when it all started. Science starts with questions. Yes. Science starts with questions. Okay, it's four o'clock. Really quickly, somebody wrote, Kim, you didn't give a quote last time. So I have the quote here. Okay. We cannot force someone to hear a message they are not ready to receive but never underestimate the power of planting a seed. Yep. Data shows that people generally have to hear something or see something seven times before they act on it, before it produces. Yes. Shift. Action. Yes. Exactly. There it is. So I'm just going to keep talking about this. So everybody's going to keep changing the world with heat and math. You got it. And with FSM, all of it. And you and I. (sighs) Do good things. You too. Enjoy. See you in a week. Bye, guys. Bye, everybody. Thanks for coming. The Frequency Specific Microcurrent Podcast has been produced by Frequency Specific Seminars for entertainment, educational, and information purposes only. The information and opinions provided in the podcast are not medical advice, do not create any type of doctor-patient relationship, and unless expressly stated, do not reflect the opinions of its affiliates, subsidiaries, or sponsors, or the hosts, or any of the podcast guests or affiliated professional organizations. No person should act or refrain from acting on the basis of the content provided in any podcast without first seeking appropriate medical advice and counseling. No information provided in any podcast should be used as a substitute for personalized medical advice and counseling. FSS expressly disclaims any and all liability relating to any actions taken or not taken based on or any contents of this podcast.